Uh, in this video, I'll be demonstrating how to change the front shock absorbers on this BMW E65 750. On this BMW, it has the EDC shocks, how you know it. You can see there's a wire coming out from the top of the shock. Now, the only difference is if you were going to be installing the EDC shocks, right at the end, you'll just plug them in. So other than that, you can follow the procedure if you're going to be just doing regular shocks. In my case, I'm going to be using regular shocks. You'll see it in the course of the video. So the first step now is to get the wheel off, and I'm now going to walk you through the procedure step by step. Right, in terms of the replacement parts, well, it does depend on how worn your system is, but here is the shock. So I'm going to be using the built-in B4. This is the cap, which is going to go over there. Then you might find that your mounting is damaged. So here is the mounting. I'll show you the part numbers as I install them. Then oftentimes the boot is damaged and then the little bump stops. So these are replacements. Uh, this little rubber here goes on the top of the shock. Often when you remove the coil, you find that this is deformed. This is not a very expensive part, so I've just got a replacement. Often people don't replace this one. And then there's a bearing that goes on the top of the shock. Now, when you're doing the shock absorber repair, you might want to consider changing your front wheel bearing if it's a little bit worn, uh, if it's, especially if it's making a bit of a noise. Right, I have a video showing how to replace this uh, front wheel bearing. Now, before you do any repair, just remember to chock the back of your wheel so that the car cannot move and the car, the handbrake is on and it's in park. Please note the use of a trestle and there's another backup trestle just in case. Right, I just blow it out to the blower. I don't want any of that brake dust in my lungs. Right, so I need to get the caliper off. The first thing I need to do is open the brake pads. So I need to separate them. Now, depending on which side you're at, the uh, brake wear sensor would be here. Just be very careful not to damage that. Right, so all I do is I take my screwdriver and I put it in a cloth. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the disc. As you can see, I'm going to separate the pad from the disc by wedging it and opening the caliper. Right, you might even notice here how it is opening. Uh, it's already opened enough. Now, my pads are still quite new so i just need to create a little bit of space there so that when i take off the caliper i won't have a problem also sometimes the brake disc is a bit worn and there's a bit of a lip here so it's hard to slide on and off so i've just separated the brake pads and now what i need to do is loosen these two screws there and there those are the two screws that actually hold the caliper on now before i do that just make sure you've got something to rest the caliper on after you've removed it because once you remove it it's heavy and it will just be hanging by this uh, pipe here the oil pipe which we don't want to happen so i've got just a, a bucket and i'm putting it there when i've loosened these i can now just rest the caliper onto the bucket now the screws at the back here are very tight now the two screws are a size 18 right i'm just using a breaker bar just to help me here just to do the initial loosen Right, so I remove these two screws and here it slides out. Just be ready to rest it on something. Right, so it is there and there's one over here. These are the two screws and there's the brake caliper. Notice it's that screw and that screw. Well, that's the only screws that are available there. Right, now I need to get the disc off. There's a number six Allen key little screw there. So I'm just going to loosen this. A uh, little tip here, make sure you use the right size because this little screw here gets easily damaged. Now notice the disc wants to come off quite easily, so I'm just supporting it here with my hand so that it doesn't fall on the ground and get damaged. Right, the next step is to remove this heat shield. This is a size 10 screw. Now this is a size 22 but unfortunately when you turn it often the whole ball joint turns that is why there's a space inside here for a size six millimeter allen key to hold the shaft in place but the very first uh, turn should be fine and i'm just going to just loosen it with a breaker bar so far right i am just making sure that this is not turning inside there because i don't want to damage this boot Right, so I remove the tie rod end. Right at the bottom is the control arm nut, and this is a size 21. I put the tie rod end back in just so that I could loosen this so this doesn't wobble too much. Right, so I've just put a number seven Allen key here just to hold it in place while I loosen the nut. 
Right, now we just have the lower control arm nut over here. There's a ball joint, so we need to release this. I'm going to tell you ahead of time that it's good practice to loosen the control arm bolt here at the back so that this can move, and you'll see why in a second. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually just loosen this. I'm not going to take it off completely. I'm just going to loosen it, but keeping in mind that when you re-tighten it, you have to tighten it when this is under pressure, meaning that the tire is on and the car is no longer jacked, so the tire presses up so that this uh, lower control arm can be tightened when it's almost horizontal so I'm just going to open this this is a size 18 I'm just using my foot in the spanner right now all I need to do is loosen this right this is a size 22 right so I can release this and it's very easy to release because I loosen that so there you can see how easy that is. Right, we can see that I can remove this. See there is that uh, upper control arm. And I just put this at a funny angle. And there is the upper control arm. I'm not going to loosen the control arms uh, bolts there. It's fine. I can actually work with it even in the way here. Right, now I've got the stabilizer link here linking the sway bar to the shock so it's got oil on it but that oil is actually oil from the shock that's leaked out onto that nut there's nothing wrong with the stabilizer link this is just oil from the shock right so all i'm going to do is remove that right i've just put a number five allen key in there while i rotate this so that the shaft doesn't turn at the same time now the next step is to remove this little sensor cable this is a size five allen key so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open this. Now you can see this cable here is a bit taut. So I'm just going to slide it off here. And I'm going to remove it from here. There's a little clip at the back. I've opened it and now I can release that cable out of the way. So now what I'm going to do is open this over here. Now this is a 16 and that's an 18. Now just note the orientation of this bracket. Now to get this off, I have to separate that. So what I do is I just spray some oil here, just to help it. And then I just take my pry bar like that. Notice that the pry bar has a increase in thickness as it goes along. So if I just put my pry bar in there and then I tap it with a hammer, then this part over here will come down. Now be very careful, we don't want to drop this on the floor. Right, so over here I have my bucket, so this is going to fall onto the bucket. And over here I just tap on my pry bar just to expand this mouth a little bit. And it's not actually that tight. And you can see it moves really easily. I don't even think I needed the oil. Notice I don't hammer on this, I'm hammering on my pry bar. Right, now the next step is to come to the shock itself. Right, so what I want to do is I want to unplug this from the shock. Now, if your shock is a regular shock, you won't have this step. So I'm just unplugging this. So I just pulled it out. And now I can loosen one, two, and three. Now notice I've loosened the one and these two are not completely loose yet. And the reason being is you need to support the strut, otherwise it'll fall down on the floor. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to loosen the other one and then I'm going to hold it with my hand by the wheel arch. Right, so here is the old strut. Right, so here's the strut. You can actually see all this oil. The uh, shock obviously broke its seal and uh, this shock is completely finished. So what I need to do now is compress these coils. And once they're compressed, then and only then can I open this nut here, change the shock, recoil it, and then put the new rubbers and bearings, etc. And then close it and insert it back on the car. Right, now these are some things to look out for. The first thing is you might notice that this plate or platform here is actually offset. So notice that if I lift that boot up here, notice the shaft there, there's the piston for the shock. Notice that that distance between there and the coil and that distance from that side to the coil is actually different. So I'm going to just quickly do a measurement uh, using the bottom loop, using the second turn as my reference. So if I go from there to there, I'm actually getting six and a half centimeters from the piston to the outside of the coil. 
now I'm going to do the same thing on this side and there from the piston to the outside of the coil it's nine centimeters so the reason why I'm showing you this is when you install this you might think you've made a mistake because the spring the coil actually it's almost like it's outward here and straight here so that's something that's very important now the next thing is where this plate sits and the reason why I'm telling you that is because on the new shock look at this here's the uh, bowl or the platform and you have to determine where it's going to sit so the problem with that is you could effectively put it anywhere and by doing that you're actually offsetting where that coil is going to sit and what i mean by that is remember that this thing is a little bit offset okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to compress the coil and thereafter i'm going to recoil the new shock now this step is very dangerous I'm just using these spring compressors, they look like this. Ideally you should get the hydraulic ones or the ones that have a mouth and the mouth comes together like this, keeping this controlled as it compresses. This is kind of doing it at your house type tools, but I'm just going to show it to you that it does work. But as I said, the correct way according to the TIS is to compress it using an actual uh, compression tool for the coil. Now you can also just go to a fitment center and just ask them to uh, depress the spring and then you can fit your new shock and they won't even charge you a lot of money. Now when you're doing this part, I highly recommend you wear protective eye gear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the longest travel. So there's a very good position because I've got all the loops. Um, now the next thing is which side are you going to be tightening from, the bottom or the top? Now I'm going to be tightening from the top because I want these threaded rods to go this way. There's more space this way. Now, you must not use impact drivers when you're tightening these things. I'm just doing an initial tighten. It's not dangerous at this point. I'm just getting it in place and I'm a little bit lazy. Afterwards, I'll use a wrench. So that one's a little bit tight. Right, so this is what it looks like. I've got one here, I've got one here, and I've got one here. I'm going to tighten these sequentially. One, one, one 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 and i'm going to slowly compress these coils and uh, don't worry about this being at an angle it's fine and all i need to do now is tighten them please remember do not use an impact driver for this step the question is about how much must you compress these coils now here's a little tip i've got the replacement shock next door and i'm going to line them up here at the back with my fingers and notice that here towards the front the replacement shock is about an inch longer than the old one so i'm just going to move this down a bit so the camera can pick up what i'm talking about right there we go okay this is actually longer than this which means that this is actually being pulled down mostly because the shock has probably collapsed or because the rubber is actually pulling this down um, i could actually try and release this this the shock i think is actually pulling itself down i think the shock has collapsed so it's actually enough what I mean by that is if this wasn't enough, this would have extended to the full length of the uh, shock. Now, obviously, this is an OEM part, so it's correct. The length is correct. So all I need to do now is loosen this nut here at the top. So in order to release it, I need to take a, a shifting spanner and hold the piston so that the piston doesn't move while I rotate the nut. This is a size 24. Uh, face this away from you and just be very careful when you do the uh, final turns here because uh, this is still under pressure and uh, I don't want this to blast off into my face which I don't think it will but I'm just saying. Right so I can remove the coil from the shock. Right so I'm just removing there's a steel disc here and this is that rubber that gets deformed as you can see it is deformed and that is why i'm going to replace it right right just having a look at the old shock i mean <laughs> it's collapsed and i mean i'm pumping this i mean look at that that's just with a finger so this shock is completely stuffed now i need to reuse this rubber right it's time to assemble the strut so i have the replacement over here now it's going to need this so i just seat this like that i'm going to take this nut off so long now what I do is I take the old shock. Now what I need to do is match this to this. Right, so I can see that that hole is about, I'm going to measure this, it is 3.8 centimeters. So from there to there is 3.8 centimeters. Why that's important is as follows. 
because this is loose, I now need to know where to place this. So you can see that on this shock where the stabilizer link is mounted, it's already been welded here. Whereas on the old shock, the plate and this is one piece. So I need to align the plate correctly. So I'm going to do that now. Right, so I'm just measuring. So it must be 3.8 centimeters. I'm just turning this a little bit more, a little bit less. Right, now if you don't get it exact, it's fine because you can align this once the coil is mounted. Right, I'm just going to tap this down. So at the moment it's 3.4 and this one over here is 3.8 so I'm just going to shift it a tiny bit more. Right, so it is now exactly matched to the other shock and now I can put the parts in. Right, so I start with the rubber seat. This can only go in one way. Now this one is a little bit deformed. Now I'm just forcing this one through. This nipple is a little bit big for this hole or this hole's a bit small for this nipple. Right, that's in. Now I'm not replacing this rubber even though it's a bit deformed because once a spring is in place here, it, this is not going to make any difference if it's a tiny bit deformed. Now the next piece is this plastic cap. Now on the old shock this would actually sit there, but on the new shock it's not sitting properly. Seems like this is too small for that. Even if you try and hit it, it still doesn't seat in there. Now on the old shock this would sit over here. And it sits nicely there and then the boot goes over and attaches to the side here. So it's basically sealed from dirt and things like that. But unfortunately on the replacement shock, this platform here is actually bigger. So this cannot go all the way down. If I measure from the base of the shock to here and the base of the shock to here, there is a slight difference. So, so when this is there, what would happen is the bump stop actually engages there when the shock gets to its um, most compressed position. Now, unfortunately, this does not fit on this shock. And I suppose you could modify it by grinding some of the plastic away, which I actually did try and do with my Dremel. And it seems like a futile exercise because I'll end up grinding most of this plastic away. And I don't even know if it's that important. Maybe in my package, uh, these were missing. Maybe the correct size was supposed to come with this uh, built-in shock and in the package they didn't have it because this is the old one. So in my case, I'm actually not going to use this. So that means that my bellows here is going to actually sit like that. And I'm actually not too worried because once the car is down, this actually is going to press on the bottom here anyway. Now, if you just leave it like this, sitting on top of that, it actually raises it by just under three centimeters. So if I take a measurement from there and if I compare it to this shock, uh, the old one, I've actually worked out that if this thing is not seated properly, you're gaining about 2.7 centimeters. Now, that for me is too significant because if I have the bump stop over there, 2.7 centimeters is about that much and this is going now into uh, the design of the dampening of the shock and I wouldn't want to change that dampening by adding an additional two centimeters maybe if it was for a sports vehicle but in this case I'm going to omit this because of this problem. So what's more important now is to fit your bump stop and the boot. Right I'm just using a generic two of these and two of these one for each side. Now the next step is this so it's facing down onto the flat part of the bump stop. Right now this is the old one and this is the new one. Notice it is deformed and why I'm changing it is that type of deformation actually makes it a little bit tight when it has to turn because it goes inside here and if it turns as you can see when it's deformed like this it's a little bit tight when it turns. Right so this is the part number of this rubber. This is an original part. Now this goes on top of the shock. Now I just want to show you, this is actually broken. You can see there the rubber is torn. So I've got a replacement and I'll show you the part number in a sec. And then this is the bearing which sits here. Um, this one's actually okay. So I, don't, I didn't need to change it, but I did change it. This is a swag part and here's the part number and there's the bearing. Now just be a bit careful when you insert this bearing. Um, the colored side faces up because this is the upward side so it goes like that and why I say be careful is if you pull on this this just opens and the track inside just falls out with all the little bearings so uh, it will fall on the floor and will get dirty so just don't try and pull this off now if you pull it off this one side is going to separate from the other and then you're going to dirty the bearing so there we go now you'll notice that it's got these little flanges around there that must be on this side not that side right 
Now, once I put the plate in, I recommend you don't take it out again. Right, there you can see it's all nice and smooth. Now, be careful, the plate is quite heavy. So if I leave it this way, it could fall out and then you'll lose half the bearing because I told you those balls will fall out of the, uh, the middle of the bearing. Now I can put this on. Now, notice these ridges aligned to the recesses on this rubber. So it doesn't matter which go where, as long as you see there, that's perfect. So this is why I changed it because it's sitting perfectly inside there. All right, so just to sum up, that, that, that there, and this would go here and there we go, but we're just missing the coil. So I'm just gonna get the coil now. All right, now very important, that must be seated Notice if you swing this around, look, it's almost perfect. Obviously, it will seat nicely once it's under more pressure, but most important is that over there. Now, because I'm using the spring clamps, it's not ideal. As you can see, this thing is not quite in the center. Uh, don't worry about that. What is going to be a problem is this over here. So just push this down. Um, we want it actually out of the way because these spring compressors, the mouths, can gouge into this boot. So we just want this boot out of the way. Now, as you can see, I'm going to have to wobble this when I install it and it'll be fine. But it, this is a bit of a technical step. Now I'm taking the other side, which is that, and I'm going to get it ready to be seated. Now, notice that it went on so easily, and that is because, remember earlier I said to you that I suspected that that shock had actually collapsed, and that is why um, I didn't need to make these coils that tight. It's actually already all the way. So what I'm going to do now is put the top nut on. Right, so very, very important is this. Look at this thing. It's smaller than the one that was there, and it faces upwards. Now I'm just going to take the nut and put the nut here. Now, as you can see, this is all the way down. All I'm doing is now compressing the shock. The springs are not pushing this up, so it's time to torque this nut. Torque the nut before you release the coil. This nut needs to be torqued to 67 Newton meters. Right, so I just have an Allen key here and my spanner, and I'm just tightening this. Right, so now it's time to release these one by one, making sure that this seats correctly. Now, while I'm releasing, I'm making sure that this is sitting in the correct place. It hasn't moved. And as you can see, it's seating nicely. And here on the top, it's beginning to seat nicely. I just need to loosen these clamps a bit more. Right, so there's the strut. Now, I just need to take this boot and fasten it over here. There's a recess for the uh, lip here. So that's going to go over there. So I can lift the bottom part a bit, which means I'm actually lifting that uh, bump stop a bit. Might have to deform this a bit by squeezing it over. Quite a bit of force. There we go. Right, so make sure that it is seated all round. Right, now I'm going to do one last check regarding this alignment here. Remember in the beginning, I said that this is very important because it determines which side of the spring is the flared side. For example, if I rotate this, notice the one side's a bit flared while the other side is not. And that's very important. So I'm going to quickly do a measurement here. I'm going to flip this upside down. Right, so from that hole to here, as I said, was about 3.8 centimeters. And I'm going to quickly measure it here. And it has moved a tiny bit. So I'm just going to tap it into place. Uh, very easy with everything on. I just tap it over here. And just a few taps. Now just a note, this is the shock absorber from the left hand side. And the left-hand side is a little bit different, and I'm just going to show you quickly. So this is the front left, and now the nipple is on the right-hand side. So can you see that it is opposite? So what we see here is that on the left-hand side of the car, the spacing is actually closer. And I'm going to quickly give you the measure. According to the OEM, which I think is a sax shock, it was one and a half centimeters from there to the, where the, to the hole. So if I show you over here, when you're doing your left-hand side, they're exactly one and a half centimeters to where that nipple comes through. Now, remember in the beginning of the video, I did measure the distance from the one side of the piston to the first flare here, and then to the other side. Okay, so I just want to show you that is six and a half from there to there. And on the other side, it is nine, which is exactly where we were with the original fitment. So I can tell that I've 
calibrated this correctly and now it is time to put this on the vehicle. Unfortunately one of the problems with using the spring compressors is it does scratch the coil so I'm just taking some spray paint, enamel spray paint and just spraying over the scratches so that no rust can form here. Right so I just take off these little covers here I get the screws ready and I feed this from underneath keeping in mind that that needs to face inwards so this has an orientation so it's actually going to be like that so when I put it in I'm going to have two nuts towards the engine side and one towards the outside of the car right so I held the shock from underneath and then I tightened these nuts there's a little nipple there to align these so I can actually tighten these right now now I just put a bit of blue thread locker on it. Right, so I tighten these to 30 Newton meters. And then I can return the cap here. Right, now I'm going to put the swivel bearing back in. Now I'm going to put the swivel bearing back on, but you might notice that the strut is facing the wrong way. For example, if you have a look here, this is where the stabilizer link goes. So I'm going to turn this now. Also notice there's a nipple there. And that nipple is very important because when we slide this on, that nipple goes through there. And I'm going to put this on. Now I just need to get the swivel bearing back up. So I'm going to flip this the other way around like that so that you can get a good view now. Right, so I've got this tool here. I'm going to lift this up to get this higher up on the strut. Please note that I use the tool just to open the mouth. It doesn't need a lot of force. You can even just wedge a screwdriver between those two sides. I then push up. It's good if you've got two people, one to hold it open, one to push the swivel bearing up. Now there is a maximum that this can go to. If you look inside here, you can see that there's a ridge. So if you keep on hammering, you're going to hit that ridge and then this is going to get damaged. Right, so I'm installing this uh, bolt. Note the bracket. I am going to put some thread locker on the threads here. Right, I took this to 80 Newton meters. Right, so the next step is to attach the stabilizer link. So I'm going to have to rotate the strut. Right, you're supposed to use a new nut. I'm going to reuse this nut, but I am going to put some blue thread locker on it. Right, I do this to a 45 Newton meters. Right, so I'm now threading this wire back here. And if yours had the brake sensor, you would also be threading the brake sensor. Right, I'm just wiping this sensor here. And now I'm going to install this in the swivel bearing. The screw for this, I just tighten to about 8 Newton meters. And then just make sure you put the thread lock on it. Okay, right, now it's time to reseat the lower control arm, the upper control arm, and then the tie rod end. Right, I'm just cleaning these. Don't want any dirt there and then also on the other mating surface now you should renew all these nuts but i'm going to reuse them and then just use thread locker now just a note just with a bit of swiveling you can get the control arms into the swivel bearing uh, you don't have to loosen anything it does go straight in so i'm just showing you the pictures of how i got it in now it's time to tighten the three ball joints each one of these is 165 newton meters because I'm reusing the nuts, I'm using the thread locker, but as recommended, get new nuts if you are putting this back on. Right, I just want to show you the orientation of the wire here. It's there, it goes round, it then comes around the back, there's a clip there, then it's held on by that bracket at the back. Right, now it's time to put the heat shield back on. Right, here are the screws, I'm just going to put some thread locker on them. Right, so it is four screws. These are torqued to 12 Newton meters. Right, tighten this to 16 Newton meters. Right, now I'm going to return the brake caliper. Here are these screws. Remember to put Loctite on them. The torque is 110 Newton meters. Now, as I grab the brake caliper, it's very important to keep the orientation of this pipe correct. For example, I mustn't twist this. If I twist it, then this pipe is going to be under unnecessary tension. I grab the brake caliper. Right, notice the brake pipe is in the same way it was before and now I can just seat this in there where there's the space on that bracket. So the brake cable is not taut. Right, now I can insert the second screw and then tighten these. Right, so I torque the brake caliper to 110 Newton meters. Right, now I can return the wheel, but don't forget the upper control arm I loosened when I removed the swivel bearing. So once the wheel's back on, I'll put the car on the ramp and I'll have to tighten 
this bolt over here. Right, I'm on the left hand side of the car and just a tip, notice this little clip here. The brake wear sensor is on this side and the mouth of the clip is on this side, otherwise it won't fasten. So here is the ABS sensor, so it's going there on the inside and the wear sensor is on the outside and then you close the clip over there. Then don't forget to thread your wear sensor over here. Now another tip is, uh, this is the brake line and when you take off the caliper it tends to go like that so why that's a problem is as follows right i've swiveled the swivel hub and notice there's the brake line now i don't know if you can see it's doing quite a harsh turn see there it's doing quite a harsh turn and look this vehicle is old you can see some of the deterioration of the pipe here now partly because the last person who worked on this didn't actually have this out enough so it was doing too harsh a turn and that's why it was starting to wear unnecessarily quick over there. So now it can turn with a greater distance giving a more gradual curvature when the wheel turns. Right, so that's what it looks like from that side and that's what it looks like from that side. I mean you could even push this in a little bit more but don't do too much otherwise it will wear here. Right, when tightening the control arm bolt, you can even ask someone to sit in the driver's seat. That's the best practice, but it's not very necessary, especially if your lower control arms have a little bit of wear on them. Right, the tightening torque is 100 newton meters, but then put it in the 90 degree or vertical position and then go 15 degrees. So once it's vertical, you just push the wrench 15 degrees more. Right, so I had it at 100 newton meters and then I just pushed the wrench 15 degrees and that's how tight you make it. Right, once you've done your shock repair, you need to do the ride height assessment. This is the ride height for the E65 and notice it says in normal position. It does not say anything about sandbags or weighing down the car. So I just have a full tank of petrol. Notice the tolerance. It allows for one centimeter in terms of the ride height position. It also allows for one centimeter difference between left and right. Okay, so to do the ride height, we first got to look at the size of the wheels. So if your rim is 17 inch, then you're looking at a 640 millimeter ride height. In my case, they are 19 inch rims. So my ride height is 66.5 centimeters. If you're using the sports suspension, here are the values. Right, once you've completed the repair, uh, you might notice your ride height has increased. In my case, it's increased, and that's because the shock was collapsed. It was actually pulling down, meaning that it was actually lowering the ride height a little bit. It is an uncommon thing because actually the coils, the springs, determine the ride height. But in this case, because the shocks were so badly damaged, it was actually uh, pulling down the ride height. Right, to measure the ride height, we go from the rim, the bottom of the mag, to the top of the wheel arch over here. Right, so it's supposed to be 66.5, and as you can see, it's 66.4. Now I must measure the other side. This side is 66.5 on the nose. When doing your ride out measurements, remember to have a full tank of petrol.